Hey everybody, welcome into another message from Journey Church in Westerville. I'm Pastor Chris, and I'm so glad that you have jumped into this message today. We're continuing our series through the Gospel of John. I want you to know if you haven't seen any other messages in this series, stay with today's. You're going to get something wonderful out of it. All of our teachings stand on their own. Uh, but when I'm done today, if you want to hear another message in this series or any others, uh, they're available through our website. That's journeywestreville.org, journeywestreville.org. You'll find links there to our Rumble channel, our YouTube channel, our Facebook page. Uh, we are a Bible teaching church in central Ohio. That's what I've gone to school for, and that's what I enjoy doing. And, and today, the passage we're in, in John 9, 13 through 38, uh, we're going to see how, how John observes the difference in the ministry that was going on at the temple uh, with the religious folks and the ministry of Jesus that is a ministry of true redemption. John, as the disciple of Jesus, is able to, to observe what's going on in, in a very close way. He's able to see all these interactions. And my, my favorite thing probably about the, the, uh, the Gospel of John, uh, about John as a man, as a disciple, and, and later an apostle, my favorite thing about him is he's very relational. He, he hones in on the one-on-one -on -one conversations that Jesus has with people. Uh, we've already covered uh, previously how Nicodemus, an older rabbi, uh, an older teacher of law, comes to Jesus at night, and, and he wants to know how he can teach in the rich and wonderful way Jesus does. And, and Jesus says, you can do these things, but you have to be born again. Well, Nicodemus asks, how? He's an old man. How can he be born again? And Jesus says, spiritually and in me. You know, John records this lengthy one-on-one -on -one discourse. He, he records a, a lengthy one-on-one -on -one counseling session where Jesus talks to the woman at the well. And, and Jesus tells her that she's in need of living water. And, and she says, give me this water so I don't have to come to the well anymore. And Jesus says, I am that well. If, if you invest in me spiritually, you can be filled and, and have incredible joy. I, I love the fact that John refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, and he shows us how Jesus loved people who were in need. And, and as we started last week in, in John chapter 9, at the beginning, the first 12 verses, Jesus heals a man born blind. Now, I made the observation last week in that message that nobody who had been born blind had ever been healed before. Yet the Bible talks about the Messiah being the one to give sight. Isaiah talks about how the one to come will, will heal the blind. They, these amazing signs that show who Jesus is are being done right in front of the teachers of the law, yet they're rejecting them. And, and this is going to be important to where we're at today. Today we're in part two of this story. Uh, Jesus had sent this man born blind to, to wash in a pool, and the man does, and he comes back and he can see. You know, one of my favorite parts of that message last week at, at the beginning of John 9 is when the disciples ask, who sinned that this man was born this way, his, him or his parents? And, and Jesus says, no, this happened so that I can do this work, so that I can be here, so that I can show who I am. Think of the greatness of this man born blind, that he uh, had all of those years of blindness so that he could show everybody that Jesus can give sight. And, and in the passage we're in today, we see how Jesus redeeming his blindness, giving him sight, it is juxtaposed, is set against how religion looks at it. And now, the religious leaders of the temple had been there. They had been through good families. They had risen up and, and been the brightest students. That's why they were selected to, to go to the temple and be priests there. It's interesting to me that John, as a young Jewish man, hadn't been selected to go, but he had been selected by the Lord himself. The Lord saw something in his disciples that the world hadn't seen. They were fishermen, they were tax collectors, they were zealots, and yet Jesus saw something special in them. You know, the Lord only knows your potential. The Lord knew the potential of this man born blind, how faithful he would be, and he's going to use him through this passage. So as I read this passage in, in John 9, 13 through 38, I want you to maybe listen as I go through it and, and think about the difference between the way religion handles things 
and the way the redemptive work of Jesus comes. Because they're highlighted in this passage, and I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm going to come back and make some observations about the difference between religion and redemption, the ministry of of religion and the ministry of Jesus in our lives. And and I'm going to make those, and then I'm going to finish out with talking about the sermon that this man born blind gives, because he gives a fantastic sermon at the end. I don't want us to miss it. It's more biblical than anything else that is being said by the teachers of the law, and it's important for us to understand. John 9, 13 through 34, religion or redemption, two ministries observed by John. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. So again, the Pharisees asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, he told them, I washed and I can see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Again, they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? Well, he's a prophet, he said. The Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received sight until they summoned his parents of the one who had received his sight. They asked them, is this your son, the one that you say was born blind? How then does he see? We know this is our son and that he was born blind, his parents answered, but we don't know how he now sees. And we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age and he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews. Since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time they summoned the man who had been born blind and told him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And the man answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he tell you? How did he open your eyes? I already told you, he said, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? Then they ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. This is an amazing thing, the man told them. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. You were born entirely in sin, they replied, and you are trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. Now, this ends on a tragic note. This ends with this man who had been born blind, who had received his sight from Jesus, being thrown out of the synagogue because he wouldn't stop telling them what Jesus had done for him. They, they threw him out. And, 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 and the reality is among the Jews, this Jewish man who was born blind, I, being thrown out of the local synagogue meant that all of your buying and selling, all of your family relationships, everything was now broken off. You were a person alone. This man was going to be in, in a very tough place. Now, I'm going to cover that next week, so I hope you'll watch next week's message. But, but listen, this week... We see where he winds up. And why does he wind up there? Because he won't stop telling people what Jesus has done for him. I, I love it. And that takes us back to the beginning. Redemption says those who see know who's given them sight. Those who see knows who's given them sight. Psalm 107 two says it this way. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This man is redeemed by the Lord's hand, and he says so. Well, back up in verse 13, where we started, the, the people in, in the area know something spiritual has happened. And so they take Jesus to the spiritual authorities, the religious authorities at the temple. I mean, who would be better trained? Who would understand the Word of God better to tell them what all this means? They want to know what this means, so they take it to the Jewish leaders in the local synagogue. They, they take it to those who were those Pharisees who were in charge. It reminds me when I was 13, when I, 
I got saved at, at a, a, a local uh, concert where they had given the gospel. And, and, and I went forward and, and on the way home in the car, my dad said, son, I'm going to take you to see the pastor in the morning, tomorrow morning. I don't know what this means, but, but pastor Harris will. And, and the next day when my dad took me in, pastor Harris opened the Bible and started showing me faithfully what salvation meant from the word of God. I'll never forget that. It was important and, and, and interesting because he took me through God's word faithfully. Now, one of the things that happens here at the beginning, when they take the man to the religious leaders, they bring him to the Pharisees to, to, they want to know what has happened. And you would think maybe the Pharisees go to the word of God and they begin looking and, and seeing the old Testament scriptures about the promise of Messiah that, that he would bring sight and they would begin celebrating Jesus. You would think they might do that, but that's not what they do. Uh, At first they ask for when this happened and where this happened. They ask for the details. And and they find one key detail that, that, that Jesus made mud on the Sabbath. Now, you won't find anywhere in the Old Testament where it says not to make mud on the Sabbath. It, it is a day of rest. But but the Jews, Jewish leaders over time had written their own books on, on what constituted work. And, and they had determined that you, you can't spit on the Sabbath, because if somebody steps in that spit, they'll be making mud by grinding the spit into the dirt, and and that would be breaking the law. They, they had laws on how far you could walk before it became work, because you had to walk into the temple and you had to do certain things, but if you walked too far, that, that became work. They had a, a million rules that they had written down about how to properly clean things and do things and how much you could do on the Sabbath. And, and if you Think about it. We all have to do something on the Sabbath. Matter of fact, a, an actual reading of the Old Testament would show that David was called to do things, that many of the Old Testament prophets and, and, and teachers were called to do some work on the Sabbath. The Lord made the Sabbath so he could look at all he had made. And Jesus is going to later on tell them, listen, if your donkey falls into a well or into a ditch, you, you know to do the work to get it out. Why can't God save his people on the Sabbath? You know, I'll tell you this, that there is no bad time for someone to be redeemed. And it is the work of the Lord to redeem those who are lost without sight or hurting and infirm. It is always a good time to do God's work. It's always a good time to be gracious, to pray, to come home to him. This man, they found a fault in their own writings. They they consulted themselves and found Jesus lacking. They didn't go to the Lord. They didn't go to the Lord's word. They found what they wanted to find in their own blindness. The Pharisees asked how he received, verse 15, and and he says, they put mud on my eyes and I I washed. And, And the Pharisees began to argue, this man is not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others are saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division. And again, they asked the blind man, who do you say that he is? And, and I love the blind man's response. He says he's a prophet. A, a prophet it, throughout the Old Testament was one who always spoke from the Lord. The, the prophets didn't have their own words or their own messages. In, in our men's study right now, we're looking through the life of King David and and, and David, when he messed up with Bathsheba, when he committed sin, God sent the prophet Nathan, and, and Nathan came and said, this is the word of the Lord. He, he was a prophet because he shared God's word. And, and I think it's interesting here that they were sharing, the priests and leaders of the temple, who, who should have known God's word, who were given God's word, who were given a front seat to, to see the work going on, consulted themselves and their own word. And yet this man knows that that redemption comes from the Lord. Redemption comes from from the hand of God. And the Old Testament confirms that that it is God's will to give sight to his people through the Messiah. You know, one of the things I want you to know about religion is is religion says that that no one else can have access to God but, but those who are at the temple, those who are holy, those who are approved. And I want to tell you it's wrong. Your pastor, uh, your priest, whoever it is, is not the only person with access to God. 
Christ is available to all. Christ was available to this man born blind. And and they took him to the leaders, and the leaders had no idea because Jesus was in the redemption business, but they were in the religion business, and their religion was the religion of man. It was just thinking in ways man can think and doing what man thinks. They didn't actually have access to the sacred, but this man knew that Jesus did. He said he's a prophet. He has access to the sacred. And they said, how could this be? He's not one of us. Well, the the interesting thing is is they go from harassing this man about uh, what happened, how did he do it, instead of who did this, who redeemed you. They want to know how. And, And then they summon his parents. In verse 18, it says the Jews did not believe this about him that he was blind and received sight until they summoned his parents. And and they asked them, is this your son? And the parents say, oh, he's of age, he's old enough, talk to him. But, but why do the parents say this? Well, the parents say this because they're afraid. They're afraid. Uh, it says, uh, his parents said these things, they were afraid of the Jews, since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed Jesus as Messiah, they would be banned from the temple. Then this isn't the first time. You know, uh, uh, in, in a previous teaching, uh, back in uh, chapter 7, 11 through 13, the, the, at the Feast of the Tabernacles, nobody w- would let the priest hear them talking, it says, because they were all afraid. They were all afraid that if, if the priest heard them talking about Jesus, they'd get in trouble. People feared the leadership. But they loved Jesus. They knew something special was happening with Jesus. Something was stirred up in them. Listen, uh, religion will tell you to do things just, you got to go to church, you got to sit through a service, you got to go to confirmation class, you got to do this. When did you have this done? When did it, and, and once they check off all those boxes, you're okay. When were you baptized? When was the last time you had communion? I, I want you to know none of those show where your heart truly is with the Lord. None of them show if you truly love Jesus. And believe in him for your salvation. None of them show that you're redeemed. Men's checklist do not show if your heart is in the right place. Religion is a bad way to tell. I I recently talked to somebody who said, you know, uh, your your church is a little bit more like a Bible study. I'd rather go somewhere where I'm I'm just hearing a sermon and I'm just going through a service and I can come back home. Religion processes you through. But reflection on God's word and reflection in your heart on who he is is entirely different. You know, I think the the Jewish leaders brought the parents in here uh, for another reason. I think they they were trying something that's called generational compliance. They were saying, because your parents are, are Jews in good standing, you should be too. And you should follow us since they followed us. And you should follow our teaching and do it the way we're telling you to do it. I know over the years as a a pastor, I've encouraged people to come to the waters and be baptized. At our, our church, we baptize by immersion, I only baptize adults, uh, people who are of an age where they could make a decision and understand Christ. And, and the reason I do that is because throughout the New Testament, everybody that's baptized in the New Testament church does so after they make a profession of their faith as an adult, as somebody who's of age and understands. You don't have babies being baptized anywhere in the New Testament. You have adults who have made a choice for Christ. And and I do think it's important here that the parents say he's old enough. He can make his own decisions. You know, I've had people tell me, well, I'm afraid to get baptized because my parents had me baptized as a child in the Catholic church or Lutheran church or another denomination. And, and, and I don't want them to feel badly like, like their baptism didn't, didn't matter. And one thing I've told people is, listen, let them know that their hopes and dreams that, that one day you would choose for Christ have now come true, and you're able to, to be baptized, to celebrate that, that your parents made a good decision, and now you're taking it on as your own. I think it's important that we all realize uh, religion is not somebody else made a decision for you or a priest said you're okay. Uh, religion will not get you home. Uh, uh, what, what is important is redemption. Redemption gets you home because redemption is when you come to Christ and he changes you. He touches your heart. He puts you in the place where he is. I I love the fact that the parents may be afraid, 
but they don't keep their son where he used to be. Generational compliance is used often in religion to keep people in those chains, in that bondage to religion that does not redeem, that does not change, that does not save. Listen, this man born blind had 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 been around the Jewish temple his whole life. And 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 you're gonna hear he's able to speak the words of the Old Testament. He's evidently heard them, but he's never been able to see them for himself. But he's heard the things that these leaders have preached from God's word, and he's hidden them deep in his heart. He loves the Lord, I believe, already. And he understands, he's going to understand a great deal about this. He's going to understand a great deal about what's been done for him. And he's not in chains to the faith of his parents. And one of the things for me growing up is my parents encouraged me that I would have my own decisions to make in my life. And I have. This man is going to have to come to Jesus himself. His parents are afraid. They don't want to make a generational change. They've been in that synagogue for many years. They don't want to go anywhere. But I think the Jews bring them in not only to find out who he is, but to to push this generational compliance that religion does. Listen, anybody can be redeemed, no matter what your family's done, no matter where your family's come from. I've talked to people that say, no, my family's always been sinful. There are no church people. And, And they say that in the way that they can't be redeemed. But anybody can be called to Christ. Jesus wants to have an individual meeting with anybody who will individually meet with him. You're not in because of your family. You're redeemed because of Jesus. And Jesus is available to all. Verse 24, so a second time they summoned the man who had been born blind, and they told him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And Jesus answered, Whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I can see. You know, Jesus lets them know, or Jesus, this man born blind lets them know that Jesus had made a change in him. As I said, religion had never been able to change anything. He could go in and out of the temple. He could hear different preaching. He could hear different things from the outside. But Jesus worked when he really needed him. And on the Lord's day, on the Sabbath, he was made well. Jesus did this for me. He wouldn't stop glorifying God. He 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 wouldn't say that because of his blindness, because of where he was, he, he didn't have access to God. He had access to him, even though he was infirm. And then they ask him a, again. They've asked him about three times now, How did he do it? And he said, I I told you. He said, do you want to be his disciples too? Are you asking me? Are you grilling me because you're going to put your faith in him and follow him? And this really made them mad because that's actually not what they were trying to do. They, They were trying to find a problem with the routine instead of find this perfect and pure person with all this power who had healed him. Instead of confessing Christ, they wanted to say, there's no easy access to God. You couldn't have met the Lord because it's hard to meet him. When he says, do you want to be his disciples too? They begin to ridicule him. And they said, we're, we're disciples of Moses. Now, this, this is interesting to me because Moses never had disciples. He didn't want disciples. That wasn't the, the purpose of Moses' ministry in any way. And by the way, at this point, when they say that they're Moses' disciples, Moses is dead. He's not there. He's not alive. He's not with them. They knew that God spoke to Moses. But this man, we don't know. Listen, uh, Moses did some incredible things for Israel. Don't get me wrong. We know that Moses did talk to God. But we also know that these men hadn't talked to God in years. And the man they were claiming to follow wasn't available for them to follow. This man, I I love the fact that he says, I'm following the one who redeemed me. I'm following Jesus. You know, some will tell you you have to follow a saint or, or a priest or you have to pray to Mary because Jesus is too holy and you can't have direct access to him. And, and they're mocking the fact that this man says he's following Jesus because who are you to follow Jesus? And that's true. 
Who are you to follow Jesus? If you declare Jesus is your savior, the one who has redeemed you from the pit, the one who has given you incredible sight or incredible life, or or like with Nicodemus, he's given you new birth into his kingdom, or, or like the woman at the well, you say that Jesus has given you living water. So now you have some joy in your life that was once empty. The world may ridicule you and say, well, well, we go to church and we do this and we take this communion and we listen to this pastor and we do all these things. I love the fact that this man has a humble confidence. And, and I'll tell you this, humble confidence comes from following Christ and knowing that you trust in him. But you know what comes from the world? What comes from the world is pride and arrogance. Because religion produces pride. You think, I've done everything right. I've gone through all this stuff. So I, that's why my life is in such a great place. No, your life isn't a great place because you've been blessed by the Lord. Not because you've served religion. Because that person who was born blind, who everybody thought maybe he sinned, he did nothing wrong. He was there to proclaim that Jesus the Messiah had come. And now he's going to be able to worship him in a deeper and better way than anyone around him because he has seen his Savior. And that's where uh, the next little phrase comes from. Uh, his humble confidence. He's humble. He bows before the Lord, but he's confident to know his Savior and the redemption he's been given. And from that basis, he gives this mini sermon. And, and that's kind of where I want to close today. In verses 30 through 33, he says, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where Jesus is from. Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Now, I'm going to stop there. He's saying if, if Jesus wasn't perfect, if Jesus wasn't perfect in some way, God wouldn't listen to him. And you think, is that so? Well, let's go back to the Old Testament. Psalm 66, 18. This is David writing. He says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now, he's talking about when he prayed to, to be restored by the Lord after he fell with Bathsheba, after he broke the law. He said, if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Psalm thirty four fifteen says this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and the ears are attentive to their cry. Now, I want to tell you some more context to this. In, in the Old Testament, Saul had, had been a king of Israel and he had been wicked. And, and God found him wanting and God told him, I'm removing the kingdom from you and I'm giving it to someone else. I'm giving it to David. And, and Saul begged and pleaded to be redeemed and to get the kingdom back and to be forgiven. But he was never restored. Saul was rejected. David, later on, after inheriting the kingdom, falls with Bathsheba. He sins. He commits murder of her husband. And yet David is restored as the king. Why? Well, we have the answer here. David was truly remorseful. He didn't cherish that sin in his heart. He didn't plan to sin again. He wasn't apologizing to the Lord just to get back what was taken so he could continue doing what he had done before. David is changed by this experience. He didn't cherish sin in his heart, so his prayer was listened and he was restored. He was righteous and the Lord was attentive to his cry. This man born blind says it's an amazing thing. You know, God only hears the righteous, and the righteous, their prayers are honest. Jesus isn't doing this for money, isn't doing this just to be made great for his, his own use. He's not doing this to take power from anybody. Jesus did this because he really loves me. His, his every thought, his every passion is pure, unlike ours. And we have to remember that, that Jesus did everything the Father asked of him, and every one of his prayers was pure. When Jesus looked at the crowd and had compassion on them that they needed a shepherd, he was doing this in a loving way, not, not to promote himself, but because he cared truly about people. When, when Jesus saw this man born blind, he didn't see a theological discussion about who sinned. Jesus saw him, and his heart was moved because he really loves us. You need to know Jesus really loves you, and all his intentions for you are pure. You never have to question why Jesus wants you. you. You may question why a religion would want you or why they'd want you to give a certain amount or be in a certain church or do certain things. You can question men's motives, 
but you can't question the motives of Jesus because they're pure, because our Redeemer is pure, and he had to be pure to go to the cross to die for us. I'll tell you this, uh, the first thing here is we need to, to know early and often that God only honors honest prayers. Uh, are you an honest prayer? Uh, are, or do you pray to get things back so you can live your life the way you did before? Uh, and, and I've known people over the years who the worst thing that can happen to them is they can be in a good place. They're, they're humble and wonderful people when things are going well, but man, give them money or give them power and, and they become awful to deal with. This man says, Jesus has honest prayers. And he did. And we need to also. I, I love this. He says he's, he, he does the will and he listens to, to the Father. And then in verse 32, he says the next thing uh, that's vitally important. He says, throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. It's true. I, look through the Old Testament. There, there's nobody else who has been born blind who, who receives their sight until now. But, but there is throughout the Old Testament a promise. In, in Psalm 146, 8, it says, The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. In Isaiah 35, 4 through 6, it says this about the prophecy of the Messiah. It says, Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Does that sound like the ministry of Jesus being covered in the gospel of John? Yes, it does. John saw the prophecies of the Messiah being fulfilled. And this man born blind saw in what Jesus had done for him. He saw in scripture the prophetic ministry of Jesus was now working in his life. The redemptive properties of the Lord himself stood before him in the person of Jesus. Isaiah 29, 18 and 19 says, In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of the gloom of darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord, the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. This man humbly now rejoices in the Lord. Listen, you guys can make fun of me. You can kick me out. You can do whatever you want. I've found my Redeemer. You can take your religion. I just want Jesus. I want Jesus and more Jesus. Throughout the history, no one's ever heard of somebody opening the eyes of a person more blind. The miracle never happened because it was a specific miracle for the Messiah, and it was happening now by the hand of Jesus. And his blindness had happened to him so that he could also show the coming of the Lord. The Lord is now redeeming his blindness, blindness by making it a wonderful revelation that this is the Lord. All who were blind to the Messiah who didn't see him could now see him because of the acts he did for this man. And this man now in this sermon is declaring it. He's saying, first of all, this man has honest prayers and he is pure before the Lord because what he asked for, God did. And, and by the way, God has never done this before, but it was supposed to happen through the Messiah and it's happening now. And the last thing in verse 32, this man born blind says, if this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. How could he do these things if he wasn't from the Lord, if he wasn't sent? I believe, I believe that Jesus was sent from the Father to, to be the Messiah, to do what only he could do, and he's showing the sign in my life, and I can declare it for you. And it wasn't about the process of putting mud and going to the pool, because you could do that and it won't change anything. It was about his prayer. The, the prayers of the righteous are powerful prayers, because they're true prayers. They're true prayers from our hearts. And listen, I don't know when the last time you prayed was, but but I would encourage you, say a true prayer out of your need, not out of your pride. Not saying, God, I'm good, I don't need you, but God, I'm broken, and I don't know how to solve this. Not, God, just give me the money because I already know how to do this, but God, I, I don't know how to do this. When was the last time you were broken before the Lord? that You admitted that you didn't know where you were going and what you were doing, and you needed his help. This man was blind, but evidently he had heard the word of the Lord read, and he had clung to it, and he was looking for that Messiah all his life that would give him sight. And, and no matter how tough life was, he never turned away because he believed that his Redeemer would come, and now his Redeemer had come and given him what he had always asked for, and he knew that that was because of the purity of the Redeemer, the special hand of God on the Redeemer. And that Jesus was different than anyone else. 
I, I don't know if you believe in the lordship of Christ or if you believe in the practice of religion. But I would tell you, you need to look in your Savior's face. Next week, I'm going to cover how you can see that face. So I hope you'll follow along to that message. But I want you to know today, if you say an honest prayer, and if you put your trust in the one and only Jesus, and you see the Lordship of Christ, He can do something for you that your religion could never do. I know people argue over old hymns and new choruses, and they argue over all these things, but I want you to know this. The Bible doesn't talk about what kind of song to sing. The Scriptures talk about what kind of heart to have when you sing. You need to have a heart that praises the Lord, that trusts in the Lord, that knows the Redeemer. Religion will tell you the the type and the words and the specifics of that. But if you know Jesus, nothing can keep you from worshiping him. And I hope today that you worship him. I hope that you love him. And, And I hope that you reflect on this passage. Because we need an overseer to our souls. Who do you trust? Do you trust a priest? Do you trust some pastor? Do you trust your family's religion or have you ever knelt before jesus and trusted in him have you ever trusted in jesus to give you sight i hope you will today let's pray dear heavenly father we just thank you that religion does not save us and as john looked at the temple and where they were and what they had become and he saw the difference between the redeeming and real ministry of jesus the lord he knew which path he was going to be on and it was not going to be the continuance of the 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 religion of man but it was going to be the continuance of of being an apostle to jesus not only was john there to follow him but to have that kind of ministry to tell people about the redemption they can have in jesus christ that there's never going to be another like him there's never going to be another one with such pure prayers for us and we come to you father we come through jesus because he intercedes for us because he's the only one that is righteous enough to do it Jesus looks through us and and sifts the purity of our hearts and our prayers because we can trust him. He's not changing the message when he gets to the Father. Father, I just pray that someone today would come home, that they would make Jesus their own, that they would search the Scriptures instead of what man has tacked on or written to the side, but they would come back to the Gospels. They would come back to your word. They would come back to the Bible as it is. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that someone would watch this and see Jesus and come home. That there would be an honest cry for help. That there would be trust in Jesus alone. And that there would be the leadership of Christ and only Christ moving forward no matter who makes fun no matter what you have to leave, no matter what you have to do. Because when you found Jesus, you found everything you need. And nothing else will take the place of him. Father, help us today to love your Son, our Savior, more. In his name we pray all things. Amen. My friends, that's all I have. If I had more, I would share it with you. I hope if you're in the area, you can come out to to Journey. I'd love to share God's Word with you as we go through this series or any other that we're doing. I, I pray that you would... Uh, have an honest prayer. You cry out for Jesus. You trust in him. And that you'd honor the lordship of Christ and Christ alone. Honor his word. Honor his ways. Love the Savior. I can guarantee this. Unlike religion, our Redeemer will love you back. Anyway, my friends, I hope you can come out. And I hope to see you soon.